Um, we'll go back to Branham, although I think you can take it back a little bit farther. Um, William Branham is, uh, after World War II, quite a popular, um, charismatic evangelist, if you would, um, who has got a really, really bizarre theology. Um, he's somewhere of a mix between current day charismatics and uh, oneness Pentecostals. Uh, firm belief in the baptism of the Holy Spirit claims that he's a prophet. And he begins developing this concept of the doctrine of the latter reign, which morphs into and becomes its own movement in and of itself. And in it is the restoration of apostles. And in it is this eschatology that teaches that Christ cannot and will not come back until the church takes dominion, conquers. Um, when I was in the latter rain, I was told that the bride of Christ has to make herself worthy. The bride of Christ can't be weak. You know, the, Jesus isn't coming back for a weak and defeated bride. He's coming back for a victorious, glowing, white, clean bride. And it's our job to go and to disciple the nations and not just individuals, but the nations and, and really make the world into the kingdom of God. And it's demonstrated in signs and wonders and prophecies and, and things of that nature. Um, and as Branham is finishing his course, um, you have other leaders picking up his concepts and, um, and developing them further, trying to back in some theology behind them, like see Peter Wagner. Um, and C. Peter Wagner writing in this talks about the kind of the third wave of the Holy Spirit and, you know, picking, you know, kind of picking up where Branham left off and the theology that he has, um, further develops it, claims that now, um, God in these latter days, I mean, really s not very long, 16 to 20 years, God has restored the office of apostle. Um, and this is all kind of working with this concept of uh, that that somehow the church, by not having apostles, has been an army without generals, and that in order to you know for this big push to to take dominion over the earth, um, God is restoring the office of apostle in order to give us generals who are going to be hearing directly from God to get strategies, and these strategies are then going to help us to tear down. Uh, satanic strongholds in the heavenlies and then take uh, and then take ground uh, for the kingdom of God and discipling nations and um, and and you know and then add into that then into the mix then comes the ultimate strategy for figuring out how to take dominion and that's the whole seven mountains mandate and so now they've now they don't not only know know what the end game is it's the bringing of the kingdom of god here to earth we taking dominion but now the strategy for doing this is laid out in the conquering of the seven mountains the media mountain the politics mountain you know the business mountain and all these you know these other mountains and quite frankly it seems to remind me more of the seven hills from uh, the book of revelation than anything but i mean that's that's really an oversimplified but you know, kind of quick flight over, you know. And so where we've come to today now, we've got people running around the landscape, you know, saying that they're apostles. And there's apostles of different kinds. There's like workplace apostles, there's church apostles, there's warfare apostles. And, and, uh, and the people that you would point to who have embraced and typify now this NAR theology would be like Cindy Jacobs, the late C. Peter Wagner, uh, C., uh, Cindy Jacobs and her, um, her generals, uh, ministry. You know, that, that's code talk. General's talk is code talk for apostles. Uh, Bill Hammond um, and you know, uh, Chuck Pierce and people like that. Um, Apostle Guillermo Maldonado and, and others who are all claiming this apostolic mantle for themselves. Um, and what's fascinating is, is that you know, their claim that in order to be a part of this big end times revival, that God is just about ready to unleash, that uh, you as an individual and your church need to be under the authority, the protective umbrella covering of uh, your local apostle. And um, which is just, again, it's just mind boggling that anyone thinks that this is somehow biblical. But that that's kind of 
the gist of the NAR. Are there apostles today? No, there are not. Um, in Acts chapter 1, uh, you have the 11 apostles that remained after the death at the suicide of Judas, um, realizing that the scriptures said that somebody needed to fill the open office. And you think of uh, the, apost the apostleship, this is an office within the church. And so the uh, credentials that were required for somebody to fill the vacant office was somebody who had to be there from the beginning of Jesus' teaching and the baptism of John the Baptist and an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and there were only two guys that fit the bill, and then they left it up to the Lord to decide by, by casting lots. And, um, and the, the lot fell from Matthias, and the office was filled, and there you go. Nowhere in Scripture, um, in any of the writings of the apostles, do you have uh, the qualifications for, the, you know, uh, the duties of somebody who is to rise up and fill vacant apostolic offices. There's no such thing, but we do have the, the office of a pastor. You, you can talk about um, the presbyteroi, or you can talk about, you know, the, the elders, you know, however you want to work the Greek out in there, but regardless, it's very clear in the pastoral epistles that somebody who is to be an overseer, who is to be a pastor, is one who has to be the husband of one wife, able to teach, you know, not uh, prone to, you know, being a wife beater or, you know, a drunkard and things like this. But there's no, there's no corresponding list for the office of apostle and what the duties are. And yet the duties of the pastor are clearly laid out in scripture. So there's like this huge omission, huge omission. But then add into the mix then Ephesians chapter 2, uh, specifically verse 20, talking about how the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the, the, the cornerstone. Well, um, basic building construction will tell you once a foundation is laid, you build on it, you don't have to relay the foundation. And so um, I think it's very clear that uh, the requirements of an apostle the fact that the apostles would make up the foundation of the church, Christ himself being the cornerstone, that this is not an ongoing office. This is not something that people, you know, God calls and says, you know, and says, you know I'm calling you, you know, from the time you're, you know, before you were born to, cut, to rise up and be a modern day apostle. That's ridiculous. In fact, the, you can also make the argument from the Great Commission itself, if you kind of think of it in this sense, is that yes this is the commission of the church but the great commission exp was explicitly given to the disciples go therefore um, or as you are going make make disciples of all nations baptizing teaching all that i have commanded well the disciples are dead but the disciples are still discipling the nations the apostles are still discipling the nations because as the church ancient said, we believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. This is what the church has confessed from ancient times. We are, we are an apostolic church, but in what sense are we apostolic? Are we apostolic because we have people who um, fill an apostolic office? No, we're apostolic because we believe the apostles' doctrine. And Jesus said to his apostles, the one who hears you, hears me. And the one who hears me, hears the one who sent me. And so the, the, the basic teaching of the scripture is quite clear. The apostles are still speaking to us today. They are still discipling the nations. They are just discipling everybody. How? Well, through the Theonoustos, inspired, written word of God that the apostles wrote. In fact, Jesus, he wrote nothing. We have no extant writings of Jesus, no letters that he wrote or anything of the sort. Nothing. So what do we do? How do we know what Jesus said or taught? Well, he sent his apostles, and that's what an apostle is, somebody who's sent. They're an emissary. So if in the ancient world, if somebody says, I'm an apostle, the immediate question is, well, who sent you, right? Well, the apostles of Jesus Christ, those who were sent by Christ are few. And then you have the apostle Paul, who is also an apostle of Jesus Christ, which is reiterated over and over again in his epistles. Although he was not part of the, the men 
who were there at Jesus' teaching in Galilee. He wasn't there at the baptism of Christ. He is a, an eyewitness of the resurrection, and he himself notes the fact that as an apostle, he is one who is abnormally born. All right? And you sit there and go, well, that's more than 12. Yeah, I understand that. But if you do a little bit of Old Testament cross-reference work, there were 12 tribes of Israel, but 13 names. How many apostles of Christ are there? There's 12, but there's 13 names. You know, I think that all kind of works that way. So the idea today then, anybody today claiming that God has made them an apostle immediately must be rejected. They're not telling you the truth. They are not sent by Christ. They may claim that they are, but they're not. In fact, there's nothing in Scripture at all, nothing in the apostolic teaching that would lend to us or tell us that in the latter days, God's going to restore apostles on the earth and give them back to the church. There's nothing like that at all. In fact, I, I would argue the person that is claiming an apostolic mantle is doing the work of Antichrist. They're not Christian. They're not sent by Jesus. They may be sent by a spirit, but they were not sent by the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, um, there's the kind of two growing seasons in, in Israel, there's, and it's based upon the rain cycles. And so there is a latter rain cycle, which kind of helps bring in a later harvest. This concept, which is mentioned in Scripture, um, in the historical narratives and other places, is, is allegorized by Branham and his followers as somehow being symbolic of a latter day harvest um um and it, it included in this is this somehow this development of what they would consider like this whole generation that's supposedly coming up um in the ranks you know it's always this like just just one generation away or it's coming up among us that is is going to operate in signs and wonders as like an everyday part of their life and um, and this then, these signs and wonders, will demonstrate the power of the kingdom, um, which will then be the kind of the catalyst for this big end times harvest. And so that group of, uh, that generation is oftentimes referred to as like Joel's army or, or whatever. And so um, what they're trying, the, the way the teaching kind of works then is there, you know, they're always kind of focusing on the younger ones, the next generation, where, um, you know, um, our, the, this current generation's ceiling, as they say, becomes the floor for the next generation. Um, and, you know, and people who pick up on the same kind of laddering concept, I mean, it, not just Chuck Pierce, but, um, oh, I can see his name, I see his face, the guy who uh, restored Todd Bentley, um, Joiner. Yeah, that's right. Rick Joyner. Rick Joyner was, he, he, he's caught up in this as well. Um, he has a whole book, which is just an awful, terrible book, caught, talking about the upcoming civil war and Christianity and, and things like that. And all of, and, and what's at stake in their, their way of thinking is this great end times harvest that God wants to bring in, you know, as part of this latter rain, because that's the big thing, the big bringing in of the nations, the big victory in Christianity that will then be the impetus for Christ's uh, return. And so there's a sense then in which that we can hasten Jesus's return by, um, by getting busy in this kingdom work. And it's in, in the other part of it then is, is that there's a splitting of a concept they'll talk about the gospel of salvation as opposed to the gospel of the kingdom. And the gospel of salvation, yeah, Jesus bled and died for your sins, you know, repent, believe. But now you've got to be part of and this thing called the gospel of the kingdom, which is an integral part of the latter reign, where you have to demonstrate Christ's power through signs and wonders and prophecies that then, again, is gives you the right to talk about Jesus, but unless you're uh, healing the sick, casting out the demons, raising the dead, um, as in, in so the point to uh, Jesus sending out 
of his disciples and say, you know, to do these things. And so this, this is all part of the gospel of the kingdom. So we've, this is our mandate. We've got to go do these things. And so in their way of thinking, because the church for 2000 years hasn't had apostles, we've been without generals. Um, uh, and the leadership has abnormally fallen on pastors then, and the church has lost the concept of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, and hasn't and and is it literally been practically powerless. Um, God, in their way of thinking, then in the latter reign, has brought back, has restored the baptism of the Holy Spirit, has restored the office of prophet, has now restored the the office of apostle. And all of this then creates the mechanism by which we can ultimately, as the church, take dominion, disciple the nations, and bring the eschaton. You know, and so this is all wrapped up and kind of packed into the concept of the latter reign. So the idea then is by splitting the gospel of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom. That creates a false dichotomy. The gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of salvation are one and the same. Scripture is not teaching two different gospels. There's only one gospel. And, um, and so the kingdom comes when somebody is brought to, through the preaching of the good news, is brought to penitent faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus says that the kingdom doesn't come via observation. It doesn't come by you know, looking for signs and things like this. He says the kingdom is among you. And and how is that so? Well, when somebody is brought to penitent faith in Christ, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They, 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 Jesus is their Lord, Savior, King, all of that. The kingdom has come. So in this life, in the temporal world that we live in that is cursed and is passing away, um, the kingdom of God is a doctrine to be believed by faith. But in the eschaton, it is visible. We'll see it with our eyes. So now we see it among us as, you know, by faith, believing that where somebody is trusting in Christ, forgiven, and Jesus is king, you can, you know, that the kingdom has come. But we don't see it in power. We don't see it in glory. We don't see it in anything like that. In fact, right now, it appears quite weak, you know. But the day is coming when that all goes away. And by the way, the other part of this then is, is that it's not our responsibility to bring Jesus back. Jesus is going to come back when the Father has assigned him to come back on whatever that day is. And it's not our job to make that day come quicker. And of course, the other kind of issue then is also this, is that the gospel of the kingdom teaches that it's your fault that you're not already operating in signs and wonders, that it's the church's fault in their ignorance that they did not operate in signs and wonders and prophecy and all this kind of stuff. Yet, the scriptures are very clear that prophecies and signs and wonders, these are given by God the Holy Spirit where and when he wants to give them and to whom he wants to give them to. It's not based upon our striving or things like that that bring these things. If God wants you to operate in signs and wonders, he'll make you operate in signs and wonders. It's not because of something you've done to earn that right or that you have the right mentality that now God can use you for these things. It's, it, that's not how this works. And so what it does, what this theology ends up doing is creating a signs and wonders theology based upon the worthiness of the person who wants to operate in these gifts. That's completely antithetical to what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3. You know, Paul specifically asks the Galatians, did the Holy Spirit do these things because of your works or because you believed with faith? He says, having then begun in the spirit, are you now trying to be perfected in the flesh? See, the opening, chap the opening verses in, in Galatians 3 make it clear that the operation of the Holy Spirit is not based upon our striving, our earning, our doing, our works, our worthiness, or anything like that. And so, I mean, their theology of the kingdom creates a false dichotomy between the gospel of salvation and the kingdom, which are one and the same. But the other part of it is, is that then the gospel of the kingdom is something based upon your worthiness, your working, your good works, your, your learning how to operate in the whatevers. This is, this is just nonsense. One of the things I find fascinating about the movement is that you, you go back in time and the latter reign I mean, there are like assemblies of God groups 
you know, that say this is heresy. All right. And whenever they're like the light is sh shown on them and people see them for what they are, they like disappear they're like cockroaches. You know, they disappear into the wall for a little bit. And then what do they do? They change the label. Okay, so for, you know, for years they were talking about th the third wave, the third wave, the third wave. And so MacArthur writes about the third wave and, you know, knocks it upside the head. And, and they stop talking about the third wave, all right? So then, uh, then that, that talk disappears, and now it's the NAR. Now it's the New Apostolic Reformation. Give it time, they're going to they're gonna morph that too, because the NAR is getting so much attention and it's not hard to biblically see that this is not what Scripture says. I mean, you just need to know a little bit of Bible, and you can say this is nonsense. All right. Um, as a result of it, I I think it's just a matter of time before they morph into and start adopting a completely different name. NAR was the name that uh, C. Peter Wagner came up with it, but he was writing about the third wave, you know, long before he was using the NAR term. But the the terms are practically synonymous. You know, and that's the funny thing is, is that, you know, when I was in the latter rain, um, I, we had a prophetess over us and, um, it, this was in, uh, this was in Seattle in the Muckleteal area. Man, how long ago is this? 88. This, this, this lady, I mean, she exercised like supreme authority over my wife and I. But um, there was, she was always prophesying that there's a shaking coming. There's, it's just around the corner. The nations are going to shake. They're going to quake. The generation's going to rise up. And we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. Listen to today's NAR people. You know, listen to Bickle. Listen to Pierce. Listen to Rick Joyner. Listen, they're saying the same things. And it's always just over the horizon, just out of reach. We just got to pray into it. We've got to lean into it. We've got to decree it and declare it. We've got to use our words to make it happen and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, they're selling theological vaporware. You know, it, it, this doesn't exist. This isn't what the Spirit is saying. This is not biblical eschatology. This isn't biblical Christianity. I don't know what it is. You go back in time. See Peter Wagner's commissioning of Todd Bentley. All right, you had the apostle Bill Johnson. That's how he how he was presented. You had Shayon there, and kind of the who's who in the NAR. And um, and he, the, the one of the reasons why that Lakeland revival took off was because that is commissioning all the buzzwords regarding the new breed, this, the, the next generation. Of the, he was seen as kind of the first of the new breed. And, um, you know, his, his anointing and his, and, you know, all these things that he was supposed to be operating with is, is that this, he's, he's taken everything to the next level. And so you, we, we, in Todd Bentley's uh, revival, the, we saw things we'd never seen before. In the charismatic movement, you know, there, there was always been, you know, people falling over, you know, you have the people slain in the spirit and you've got the healing lines and the fire tunnels and all that kind of stuff. But Todd Bentley comes on the scene and he, he is he is literally presented by C. Peter Wagner as like the guy who is the first of the new breed. And so when when the, the, the Lakeland revival you know, erupts as a result of this. I literally think it's because of C. Peter Wagner's endorsement and the way he was commissioned and all these guys who were there. And so he's he's no longer, you know, he's not just doing, you know, the laughing uncontrollably and all this kind of stuff. Now he's healing, you know, with BAM, you know, and, 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 and in fact, it was so ridiculous that people called him BAM BAM. And you think back to, you know, he'd, he'd tell the stories of like, you know, the Lord told me, you know, that that woman has you know stomach cancer and he, and he wants her to, he, you know, the Lord wants him to kick her in the stomach with those biker boots, you know, and everyone, no one's questioning any of this. It's just, this is patently absurd. This is, this is nothing biblical about, you're going to kick a little old lady with stomach cancer with your biker boots because that's the way the Lord wants to heal you. Well, if he's part of the new breed, and this is and this is what they've been talking about for decades, the new breed is coming. The new breed is coming, and now the new breed is here, and they're going to do stuff you've never seen before. So he's doing all the stuff they've never seen before, and they just think it's the fulfillment of the new breed prophecy, right? And of course, the whole thing practically blew up overnight when, you know, he was 
having an affair with his babysitter. The, Todd Bentley's restoration. Um, I, what exactly did he repent of? I mean, he's same terrible theology, same Bible twisting, same false manifestations of the spirit. Um, he's now married to his former babysitter. I, yeah, no, I just don't see it. And then, I mean, all around, I mean, from his theology to his rap sheet when he was younger, to the, you know, crimes that he committed when he was a younger man, to the sins that he committed with the Lakeland Revival, and the ongoing nonsense that, that you know, and his tall tales that he tells. There's nothing about this man that's Christian, biblical, he can't rightly handle the word of God. He's not an evangelist for Jesus Christ. He's not part of a new breed. He's just part of the same old circus sideshow that the devil sets up. See, Peter Wagner was the theologian of the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, he grew up kind of in a more traditional denomination and then felt compelled to believe that what was happening in the latter reign and the charismatic movement was a bona fide move of the spirit and joined in and um, he was a fascinating fellow um, because he he is the elder statesman kind of as the, as the respected theologian in the group um, framed up the biblical part of uh, you know in order to kind of create the doctrinal appearance that this is somehow biblical what the NAR is up to from the restoration of apostles and prophets to uh, their dominion theology the seven mountains mandate mandate he was also an expert in church growth um, if I am not mistaken he was uh, the doctoral advisor for Rick Warren and his uh, PhD and um, and so when C. Peter Wagner spoke, there was there was a kind of a gravitas, a um, you know a weight behind him that many of the others don't don't have. Um, one of the things that happens in the NAR is is that the person who is a a Bible nerd spends a lot of time in Scripture. That somehow is bad. Um, that's dangerous. It leads to pride and arrogance. And the NAR as a whole indoctrinates people to turn this off. And you know, kind of like the Jedi, reach out with your feelings and be irrational and embrace the irrational, um, as if somehow that's the real proof that God is in the mix. You get rid of anything that is formal, structured, or whatever. See, Peter Wagner was an outlier though, because he 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 provided more structure and theological content. But one of the more interesting things is is that um, years ago he put together a video where he specifically is talking about how the church has a mandate to do greater works than Jesus. And in the midst of that video, he gives a Christology which is actually aberrant. Um, it's a Christology called canonicism. So he's in a neo-canonic, um, he, he was neo-canonic in his Christology, which basically works kind of like this, is that he literally teaches that um, the, that Jesus did every one of his miracles by virtue of the fact that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He, during his lifetime, even though he was both God and man, according to C. Peter Wagner, he made a covenant with God, the Father, that he would not utilize his, his uh, divine you know, powers at all uh, from the time of the, uh, his birth uh, by the Virgin Mary up to the point of his death. But in that time, he made a covenant that he would not access his divinity. And so everything that he did, all of the miracles he did, he did as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus then becomes the example of the Spirit-filled Christian and shows us what is possible. And our job is to embrace that concept so that, that we go and do more. So Jesus walked on water, you should walk on water too. Jesus healed the dead, you should raise the dead also. Jesus gave sight to the blind, you need to give sight to the blind. And so this is the, that's all part of his, his Christology. And so, um, which is absurd because how does a human being 
in and of himself only die for the sins of the world. I would say that no human being can do that. So, at least not a sinful fallen human being. And this actually runs, his, his uh, Christology runs in direct collision with the Council of Chalcedon. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a totally aberrant Christology. And um, it's, I, I think it's as bad as if, not, as, if not worse than Nestorianism. You know, I think it, it falls into a, a heretical Christology. So, um, see Peter Wagner, very dangerous man because he um, was able to create the illusion that somehow the Bible teaches and supports the crazy things going on in the NAR. So, I, I don't know who can replace him within the movement. I don't think there's a theologian among them at this point. So... IHOP, years ago I had a, a gentleman who worked for me when I was in the corporate world, um, young fellow, and um, wrote a letter and turned in his resignation. And he, he had, his wife had just had a baby, so I mean, these kids are in their 20s. And where are you, why, why are you quitting your job? It's a good paying job, you know, you know, is there something wrong with the company? No, 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 this, I, I'd work here again if I could. All right, well, where, where, you, where are you gonna do now? Oh, my wife and I, we're selling everything we have and we're going to Kansas City. What's in Kansas City? IHOP. International House of Pancakes, what's that? He's all, no, 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 International House of Prayer. 24-7 prayer room. We're going to go be part of the, 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 this move of the Spirit. Never heard of it. That, that was the first time I'd ever heard of it. And I thought, that's weird. It sounds cult-like. sounds really cult-like. And, um, and IHOP and Mike Bickle are one of the major outlets for the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, Bickle, I would argue, is operating as an apostle. Um, you know, as a man who claims that he, you know, can operate in the gift of prophecy. And all of these 24-7 prayer rooms, this is all part of their spiritual warfare theology, okay? When you're in the movement, everything is about, and I wish I was making this up, everything is about fighting demons, deliverance and inner healing, and stuff like that. You come into the movement, um, the, one of the first things you're going to experience is um, you being ministered to by somebody who uh, is an expert in deliverance and inner healing. They're going to get rid of the, um, the whatever demons that you might have. And, um, and so um, then the other part of it is, is that you need the prophets and the apostles whom God is giving inside strategic warfare information to, um, Mike Bickle being one of them, on, on you know which demonic forces are over these different territories or nations and stuff like that, so that you can th wage spiritual warfare against them and tear them down out of the heavenlies, take away their power and strip them, and then uh, kind of the way Lou Engel describes it in his uh, Spiritual Air Force Academy. You know, we're gonna have a Spiritual Air Force Academy. The reason why we're not making making progress on the ground war on is because we're having to tear down the. the <laughs> I wish I'm making this up, but I'm not. But that's kind of the, this concept. So in order to make to to take ground for the kingdom on the ground, you have got to wage war with whatever demons and you know, demonic forces. It's kind of like. Um, Frank Peretti's book, This Present Darkness, like on steroids. Um, and so IHOP, Mike Bickle, International House of Prayer, and the 24-7 prayer rooms, that's what that's really all about. You know, the constant around-the-clock praying and all this kind of stuff is about doing warfare, you know, against the demonic forces for the advancing of the kingdom. And so Bickle, I mean, and I've refuted a few, a few of his sermons on fighting for the faith, and the guy's clueless as an exegete. I don't think he's capable of rightly exegeting a biblical text. Um, and yet he, he has no problem saying, you know, I had this dream and God showed me this and did that. And, you know, and 
and yet I think it's de it's easily demonstrable that the man is a false prophet, and yet IHOP and Mike Bickle they are major pillars within the NAR, major pillars. Bill Johnson is another again bulwark rock star in the NAR. Bethel is um, is the church that he's created up there in uh, Redding, California, and he literally describes it as as a laboratory. We're trying to figure out, you know, with the spirit what is possible and what is not. And so he'll say that you know, and the stuff that is clearly unbiblical, he never will repent of it. It's always well, you know, in our in, in our environment, uh, this in, in our laboratory, you know, we 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 tried this and that and the other thing, we, and we're still learning what works and doesn't work, kind of thing. And um, he he's just he's a wicked twister of God's word, and he doesn't make any sense. Um, the, the 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 closest thing I can make as a, as an analogy is is that when if you were to listen to him and you can do this with just about any of his sermons, you know, go to the, go to the Bethel Church podcast on iTunes, randomly pick a sermon by Bill Johnson, take the playhead, randomly put the playhead at a particular place and just start listening. You will not have to go far before you're scratching your head and thinking what on earth is this man talking about. Um, he engages in, it's not exegesis, it's not even narcissus, you know, which is another manifestation in all of the church, but um, he engages in a form of wordplay that um, is very akin to a character that shows up on the New Tonight Show with uh, Jimmy Fallon. The character's name, I think, is um, Met's Bucket Hat Fan, okay? And you should look. You should look this up. That what this guy does, and it's, it's silly. It's you know, it's a silly character. You know, he he's in the audience, and you know, he'll interrupt Fallon, and and, and you know, and say, "I can see where you're going with that." And then he says, "You said this word, and this word leads to this word, and that word then means this, and then ha oh, oh, the conclusion, therefore." And none of these things. It's not connected. But Bill Johnson does the same exact thing. You know, I sit there and say, you know, um, it says, "I will enter his courts." I will enter the gates with thanksgiving, you know, and praise. And see, gates, you know, in in the old in the Old Testament, they're made of this, but in the New Earth, they're made of pearls. And see, pearls come about as a result of agitation. And agitation is the means by which God causes us to grow. And, and this is the way He talks. And you sit there and go, "What is He talking about?" You know, because if you were to sit here and try to diagram His sentences and put it on some kind of a lucid outline, it doesn't make any sense. He just He just kind of takes these words, uh, you know, out of these sentences, pours a meaning into them, connects them to another sentence with a, that uses a similar word or concept, and and spins these things out. And people are sitting there going, "Whoa." Whoa! Oh, that's deep! And you sit there and go, it's nonsense. He's not saying anything. Nothing biblical. He's not exegeting a text. He doesn't start with a text and say, today let's open up to uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to be working through chapter 18, verse 1, through chapter 20, verse 22. And then as you're working through the text, note how to rightly understand, here's what the Hebrew means here, and stuff like that. He doesn't do any of that. Okay, this verse out of context, this verse out of context, grab that word and say, and then kind of flip its meaning and then go, oh, and then if I connect it to over here, this is how he does it. And so if somebody literally goes to Bethel, they're going to be told signs, wonders, and apparently they have gold dust and glory clouds. And I'm just thinking they need to get somebody to get up there and clean out their, their air conditioning system. You know, all of this stuff is easily reproducible as like a parlor trick. And um, and the man never points to Christ and crucified for our sins, doesn't preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins, doesn't ever rightly handle a biblical text, um, and he's just pontificating this nonsense. And and people think that uh, that he's somehow a great church leader. He's nothing more than a great deceiver. And the signs and wonders that they're pointing to, they they these are not signs and wonders that. That bolster, you know, that bolster and back up the preaching of Christ and Him crucified for our sins. Um, even if they were to do a scientific study and say, no, we've actually determined that these miracles being claimed by Bethel really took place. 
all right? That, that doesn't mean that, it, that they're from God, because Jesus himself in, in the Olivet Discourse says that in the last days that false teachers and false prophets would perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So you look at his teaching, none of it makes sense. And then out of Bethel also, I mean, although they're, they're, they're trying to find a way to kind of sweep it under the carpet, I mean, Be the, the people at Bethel, the leaders at Bethel, and uh, Benny Johnson, Bill Johnson's wife, they, they were the ones practicing a form of necromancy called grave sucking, where you can apparently, you know, go to the grave of, you know, some of the ain't they, some of the dead heretics, you know, and that's the people that they kind of go to, and you can somehow get their mantle or anointing, some leftover anointing residue can get on you and your and stuff. And there's, there were photographs on you know Instagram on you know on the social media feed of Benny Johnson of her laying on the grave of C.S. Lewis or hugging the tombstone of Charles Finney and and you know and the, and the people in the comments saying get me some get me some you know as if somehow she's you know, getting some kind of anointing from this. And what's funny is, is that in the Michael Brown interview, I mean, never once did Bill Johnson acknowledge that, yeah, my wife was actually practicing this and doing this, and it created confusion within the body of Christ, and it's a false doctrine, and we've repented, and you need to know that there, that this is not, you know, so they, they, they're, they're part of all of that, you know. And, you know, then they, they also have this resurrection, great, you know, they, these dead raising teams and stuff like that. Um, and yet, look at the claims. They've never raised anyone from the dead in the truest sense. There's been no actual resurrections by their dead raising team. All they're doing is chasing after these signs and wonders and waves of the Spirit. And the more they chase after them, the farther and farther away from Christ and Him crucified they, they become. You know, they're, they're like blown hither and yon by every wind of strange doctrine. And they think it's all from the Holy Spirit. And there's no reason to believe any of it's from the Holy Spirit. Because Bill Johnson doesn't rightly handle God's word. End of story. So the Seven Mountains Mandate actually in its origin claims to be a direct revelation from God as far as a strategy for taking dominion. And uh, the gist of the the gist of it is is that in order to take dominion, um, all of the world's structures have been parceled up into the seven mountains, um, or you can all you can also call them the seven spheres of influence. There's kind of there's there's different ways in which they talk about it, but seven mountains is one of the clearest ways that people talk about it. And so the job of the church is to raise up people who will then take their place in these different mountains for the purpose of taking dominion. Um, you think about um, Sun Ho and her husband at uh, City Harvest Church in, uh, in Singapore. You know, the whole, the whole part of, the whole goal of her going into secular music um, and the church supporting her in this endeavor this was their move to take over the media mountain in their part of the world. Um, and then the idea then is, is that as Christians rise up and you know take positions of power within these seven mountains and take dominion, that then w we can become influencers and use our positions of power for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of taking dominion. So. Um, we take over the government, we can create uh, theocracy here on earth. We take over media. Me uh, Hollywood no longer is a threat to Christianity, but is yeah, Hollywood is now working with the church to get the message of the gospel out. Um, you know, in uh, the purpose of being a Christian within the, the, the business mountain is for the purpose of making money. The, the money that then is the fueling these other projects. And so, you know, so you got all these, di you got these seven different mountains. And again, the, this is the strategy by which the church is supposed to, well, bring the, hev bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. You know, uh, you know, our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom comes then through our taking of the seven mountains of mandate. That's the idea. And this is claimed to be uh, based on a direct revelation. It's a form of dominionism. Um, I would I would argue that it probably is 
um, somewhat influenced by the post-millennial um, reform guys like Rush Dooney and others and their dominionism, you know, although they don't, I don't think they would like the connection being made. Ultimately, they're, they're kind of doing the same thing. Why is it that these NAR organizations and networks put on these business seminars? Why business seminars? We're going to teach you how to start a small business and how to, we're going to teach you how to be a good leader. And there's always this emphasis on leadership, leadership, leadership. And the reason for this then is, is that, you know, and I, and I've talked about this briefly, but the idea then is that the, the, the business mountain really, there's no way to conquer that mountain per se, because business is such a broad topic. But the idea then is, is, is that as somebody ascends the business mountain, their net worth and their power for wealth generation increases. So that then they are really admonished to leverage their position within the, the business mountain for the purpose of money generation for funding, funding these other projects. And that would then include funding, um, candidates who are NAR in their vie for taking over the government mountains, funding the churches in their expansion and their growth and the growth of the kingdom. Um, you know, I, if you were to think of it kind of crassly, then the people who are really admonished to become business apostles and things like that, they become the cow that they milk for cash to fund the network and so that's an important and vital part of what it is that they're doing and why they spend so much emphasis on you know business development and stuff like that it it's not a, it is and i mean this it's not uh, an anomaly that somebody like lance walnow all right this is the, the in the nar lance walnow is your go-to guru when it comes to the seven mountains if you want to bring in a heavy hitter to your nar church it, somebody who's going to lay out the, the what the seven mountains are and how we're supposed to, you know, get on board and strategies for achieving success and that's Lance Walnow. But what else is he? He's a business consultant. I mean, that's that's his other big thing. You know, when he's introduced, he's recently on uh, Jim Baker's program talking about Donald Trump. You know, having the Cyrus anointing <laughs> from Isaiah 45, which is just absurd. Um, but, I mean, you know, so he's there talking about these things and he's introduced as what? A business guru. Why? Why business guru? Because you want to have these workplace apostles who are really well placed in the business world for the purpose of money generation and wealth generation. Because that then, you know, the money is the jet fuel that keeps the whole network flowing and working and making it for them to be able to make, you know, their strides. And so, you know, that's where I put it. The, uh, the government mountain is the one that scares me. And, um, you know, their overt talk of really bringing the kingdom of God here to earth means that, and I, and this, I can't think of it in any other way, is that if they achieve their objective, they're going to set up the equivalent of a charismatic Sharia law wherever they take control. And that just gives me nightmares thinking about it. And, um, you know, there, there was some um, talk during the past presidential season that uh, Cruz, you know, his father is NAR. And so there's speculation as to whether or not he had those same concepts and ideas. Um, and so um, Cruz was one of these guys that um, had he won the presidential nomination, I probably would have had difficulty supporting him, even though he's an evangelical Christian, just because I don't know what, what it looks like when somebody who's NAR conquers the government mountain in any particular place. Um, based upon the irrationality and unbiblical theology that they have, I just can't imagine that that's a, going to be a good thing. Ten years ago, um, in evangelicalism, the big threat in evangelicalism was, was the emergent church. And everybody was talking about post-modernity emergent church and the emerging church and, and all of this stuff.
that you know that revolved around all of it and you know guys like Tony Jones and Brian McLaren who are teaching just rank false doctrine and you know we're clearly heading in a hard left liberal direction um, they were still being invited to Willow Creek and you know very large um, influential churches within evangelicalism and that was the big threat that uh, Christianity faced at the time the emergent church imploded just plain and simple and it just ceases to exist as any kind of an ongoing central thing that you can even identify no one's talking about it anymore in from then until now the new apostolic reformation has been growing in influence and it's no longer um, something that's on the fringes of evangelicalism it's actually found a way into the mainstream of evangelicalism and because of its radical views its false holy spirit the holy spirit they believe in is not the biblical holy spirit um, it's because of its screwed up um, eschatology because of its taking people's focus off of the great commission and making disciples um, and onto the gospel of the kingdom and somehow demonstrating the power of god this is this has become i think the greatest that threat that christianity currently faces and um it, it's it's really really extremely dangerous and there's a lot at stake i mean people's souls um, and the Great Commission itself, and here's the thing, and this is why I say this, is that we clearly are living in days where Christianity is, as a whole is having less and less and less influence on society. And um, I believe that this is due greatly due to the fact that Christianity is off topic. It's off mission. We've been called by Christ to make disciples, baptize, and teach all that he has commanded. Nowhere has Christ commanded us to conquer seven mountains. Nowhere has he, does the scripture teach that we're to, to expect apostles to show back up on the scene. No, and it's not our job to bring the kingdom of God visibly to earth or to somehow hasten Christ's return. That's, none of these things are actual biblical teachings. And so the more Christianity that uh, visibly buys into the false teachings and concepts of the NAR, the worse our situation is going to become because the end result is going to be fewer and fewer actual biblical Christians. And that's a problem because uh, Christians are salt and light within society. And as there are fewer and fewer of them because of this, the NAR's inability to actually reproduce biblical Christians, it's just going to mean more problems for society as a whole. And it's, it, it's just bleak. And unfortunately, um, my children and my grandchildren, you know, are the ones who are currently reaping the harvest as a, you know, of the generations that preceded them. And they're getting off topic and failing to actually do their part in the Great Commission. I fear for us for the future.